On this edition of Fulton at Work, starting a conversation. County officials and residents work together to curb the rise of crimes committed by juveniles. And we'll examine some of the programs the juvenile courts have created to keep our youth on the right track. I'm Daryl Carver. All this and more is coming up on Fulton at Work. Please stay with us. Welcome to Fulton at Work, I'm Daryl Carver. Crimes involving teenagers are up, and with this troubling trend on the rise, officials are having conversations to address the issue before it gets any worse. FGTV's Priscilla Ortega has more. In the sanctuary at Impact Church in East Point came a serious conversation with parents. The issue, what to do about the rising number of juveniles ending up on the wrong side of the law. That it takes all of us to build a bridge. It takes all of us to heal a community. This was an event where state and local elected officials, police, pastors, community members, and parents all came together. We are here today honoring his spirit and his commitment to young people and families. Before he passed away last month, Judge Lovett helped initiate the gathering in hopes of keeping youth out of trouble. Juvenile court employees are working to continue those efforts. When kids come to juvenile court, we do everything we can and everything uh, even beyond what is required of us to serve them. But what we want to do is reach them before they get to juvenile court. And we believe that all of us are part of that solution. Police Chief Gary Stiles specifically hopes to stop crimes at gas stations, many of which are committed by youth. In the past, 17, 18 months, we have arrested approximately 50 juveniles uh, for those crimes, and all the way up to armed robbery, aggravated assault, attempted murder. Parents, grandparents, and kids who attended were asked to talk with elected officials and police about their concerns and suggest programs that will get kids involved in their community. It takes all of us to work together to create positive solutions for our children, our families, and our communities. Thank you, Priscilla. Joining us now to talk more about the conversation with parents, with the Parents Family Forum is Juvenile Court's Chief Administrative Officer, Omatayo Ali. Ms. Ali, first of all, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. Now, now talk about the inspiration to help create this forum called A Conversation with Parents. Where do we go from here? You know, in our con continued effort in juvenile court to find the best outcomes for children, in addition to the outcry from the community and, and what we call the cry for help from those children who have been involved in those crimes that um, have just been descri uh, described, Juvenile Court has started a new initiative where we're going into the community to talk to the parents and the community for all of us to get together and create a lasting solution to the problem. We in Juvenile Court will believe that while we look at what the children are doing, we have to look beyond the children to find a solution to the problem. Now, there's an old proverb that says, when you plant a lettuce and the lettuce does not grow, you don't look at the lettuce and say, oh, what happened to your lettuce? You look to the reasons why it's not growing. That is exactly what we're doing in juvenile court. What is it that we're not doing right? What do parents need to do better to make sure that our children can thrive? And so we're taking this conversation on the road to our different communities and in partnership with the stakeholders to make sure that we can find a lasting solution to the problem. Why do you think it's important that juvenile courts in particular launch this sort of initiative to reach out to these families? Well, you know, in juvenile court, we do all we have to do to provide resources to our children to be rehabilitated. We go above and beyond the call of duty, uh, what the statute has asked us to do. We have schools, we have health centers within the court, but the children are still coming in droves. And so the question for us is why is the pipeline still continuing? Why is it that we're still having children come to our court who have been expelled from school, who cannot go to school, who are not thriving? And so while we do everything we need to do in juvenile court to rehabilitate the children, the real question is, what do we need to stop them from coming to juvenile court? And that's what this conversation is about. 
Now, as you reach out to those families, I mean, obviously parents are a huge role in this, but so are grandparents. Talk about the influence in particular that grandparents can play. And our grandparents, we really appreciate them. You know, we have a grandparents raising children. Uh, they meet on Thursdays at the Mechanicsville Library. This is a um, collaboration, Juvenile Court and Mechanicsville Library. They have partnered to um, engage the grandparents in helping us to raise the children. Now, when parents are absent, and they could be absent for any reason, it could be because they're ill, because they have to work late, because they, um, some parents, because of death, substance abuse. It doesn't matter what it is, when parents are absent, someone needs to provide structure for the children. And so our grandparents have come in to help us provide that structure. Uh, they create a safety net for the children, they keep them safe, they give them a place to thrive, a loving home so we can keep the families together. Our grandparents have been very phenomenal and we just thank them and thank them tremendously. With those parents and with those grandparents, does there seem to be one overarching main concern between those groups and even the folks from the community that attend these forums? Well, for the folks in the community, it's always about community safety, uh, to make sure that children um, engage positively, both when they're in school and in the community. But for the grandparents, most, uh, most especially, uh, they have a lot of concerns, and I'll just mention a few. Financial issues, health concerns, because you know they're a little bit older than when they raised their own children. They have legal issues, they don't know how to navigate the system. They have coping skills. And so those are some of the concerns that we deal with on Thursdays when we get the grandparents together to help them navigate the process and to give them support. Now these forums are taking place two times a year. Will they always be in the same location? Oh, absolutely not. Because what Juvenile Court is doing is that we're going to different parts of the community, different parts of the county, to make sure that we engage partners along the way and that we'll listen to neighbors and community members in different neighborhoods. Now, uh, for the first one, which we will have every uh, winter, it will be, um, it will be in, in a community that's different from the last one. The last time we were at the Impact Church, the next time we will be at an academy, which is an elementary school. Now, as you go along, are there plans for other family and parent-focused events that the community can take part in? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the next event that we will have, we have one coming on, which is a spring event, is going to be the workshop, where the parents can have breakout sessions to deal with children's health, nutrition, uh, how to prepare for standardized exams, how to help your children thrive at home. What do you do at home to make sure that these children can succeed when they go to school? That's going to be the next one. Then we will have a provider's workshop, which is also going to be in the spring. And that's when we call all the community providers to come together. Those entities in our communities who know how to provide for children, we're calling all of them to come also in the spring. And then we'll have another parent forum, which is going to be uh, before the children go out in the summer. And that time we're asking the parents to come together to learn what it takes to help the children thrive during the summer. Do they get new jobs? Do they go back to their old jobs? What do they do to make sure that when they go back in August, they have not lost everything they learned in the previous year? And so, to bottom line, where can viewers go to find out when a future conversation with parents is actually taking place? Thank you for that question. Uh, you can go to Juvenile Court website, is www.juvenilecourt.org, uh, or you can go to the, we have a community Facebook page, which is called A Conversation with Parents, or you can just call us in Juvenile Court, 404-612-4402, to find out where the next program is going to be. Really important information. When we come back, we're going to talk about the programs and strategies being implemented to keep juveniles on the right path. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Folded Work. I'm Daryl Carver. In our last segment, we talked to Omatayo Ali from the Juvenile Courts about the Family Forum series, A Conversation with Parents, and how it's helping young people turn their lives around. Now we want to focus on some of the programs and methods that have been, that have been designed to do exactly the same thing. Now, since, Ms. Ali, since you began your work in the juvenile justice system, 
What have you observed as some of the risk, risk factors that cause a lot of kids to come in contact with the courts in the first place? Well, the first one is poverty. Uh, most of the children that we see in our court come from very poor homes, uh, and that leads to other factors. It leads to lack of parental engagement. It leads to truancy. It leads to substance abuse. Youth substance abuse, youth substance abuse is very prevalent. We see a lot of that. It leads to neglect, abuse, ongoing abuse especially. And so really when you take it back, you see that uh, poverty is really the source of most of the most of the problems that we have in juvenile court. Talk about some of the early intervention strategies and what role you think juvenile court can play in helping kids get back on track. Well, juvenile court, we build all our resources around um, a number of initiatives. The first one is education engagement. We believe our children must go to school. Uh, we also do mental, mental health assessment for the children and provide them with the appropriate mental health resources. We look for job placement for the children and so that they are engaged uh, when they need to find jobs and be productive. And so those initiatives are what we build all our resources around. And so to that end, our juvenile court actually has a full-time school within the building because we understand that a lot of our children have been expelled from school before the age of 16. And why is 16 important? 16 is the requisite age for, G, for preparing for GED. And so we know we have to get them engaged. And so to that end, we have a full-time school that's been supported by uh, Paxson. Paxson is a subsidiary of the Eckhart Drugs and Eckhart Kids. And so they have brought the school to us and we have our teachers, job placement um, personnel, probation officers, behavioral health clinicians who work with our children as if they were in a regular school to prepare them for the GED, to help them recover credit so they can go back to school when they have been suspended, or help them find jobs when they need job placement. We have a probation department that's well equipped to provide those rehabilitative resources that are um, culturally and and structural, structurally responsive to the needs of our children. We have accountability courts, we do have three of them. We have the family drug court, the juvenile drug court, and the mental health courts. And those courts help the children not only to be accountable, but to make sure that we can provide the resources that they need. We have in our court the Transy in Intervention Program, which is a 501c3 organization that we're blessed to have. We have CASA that's providing services to children who are dependent and deprived. We have a lot of programs within our court uh, to target the needs of our children. Now, what resources are out there for a parent whose child hasn't necessarily gotten involved in the court system as of yet, but that parent could also use some help and some expertise in kind of navigating some of the challenges that they face so their kid doesn't become involved in the system? Well, thank you for that question. That's actually very important when you think about the conversation with parents that we're having. Now, children that are involved with the court will take advantage of all those resources that I just talked about but there are parents and children who are not yet involved. And that's really the reason why juvenile court is on the road to in the communities, to make sure that we can disrupt the pipeline. Now, those parents can call us in juvenile court 404-612-4402 and ask to speak to someone in the complaints office or in administration. And we will help them to navigate the process, make sure that they know how to find the resources that they have need for their children. Now, starting in March, Juvenile Court will open its doors to these parents that you just described on Saturdays. On Saturdays, we do the tutorials with children from 12 to 4. On Saturdays, we do yoga. We are encouraging parents to come to Juvenile Court because we will have staff on hand that will be available to answer their questions. Now, in addition to understanding a lot of the legal consequences, things like well, nutrition, school performance are also important for getting kids on track. Tell us a little bit more about that and, and their role in this process. Well, I think nutrition has been, um, it's been proven to be the best link to academic success. And so we will have a workshop in the spring that will talk to parents about what to do what to feed their children before they go to school, what to feed them when they come back home so that they can thrive. Uh, nutrition is very linked to cognitive functioning, to academic success, and to, for the students not to have some of those social 
behaviors that we have just described. But I don't think that's so much of a problem anymore because of the lunch program that's been established by the federal government. And Ms. Ali, what are your final thoughts on the goals of Juvenile Court's Family Forum series and the potential that it has to kind of bring this community together? Well, our goal is to get our community back to where it needs to be. We want to put people back in the villages who do what they need to do. Juvenile Court understands that we cannot do it by ourselves. We want to make sure that when we provide the resources to the children who come to us, there's a place for them to go back in the community. We want to make sure that the children who are in the community who have not reached Juvenile Court will not make it to us. We want to disrupt the pipeline. We want to make sure that we can engage our children in a productive manner. We can only do that with the help of our community, so we are going back in the community to ask for help and to make sure that we can get lasting solutions to the problem that we have today. Ms. Omataya Ali, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you for having me. We'll be back to wrap up the show after this short break. Stay with us. That's all of our time and thanks for joining us and a very special thanks to our guests today. Now we want to connect with you online. Check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'm Daryl Carver and we'll see you next time.